Hey guys, Martin here, back again with another video, and this is my first video of 2019, where I will be aiming to upload one video to YouTube per week, all about training and nutrition, ranging from beginner to advanced topics. Now, we at JPS will be bringing a lot of content to you guys this year, whether it be on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and even our online mentorship, which is launching soon. So stay tuned because there is a lot to be learned in 2019. Now today's video is all about metabolism. And the reason I've chosen this topic is because I feel a lot of people talk about metabolism in a very simplified form, with little understanding of what metabolism actually is or what it actually encompasses. So metabolism is actually the total opposite to simple. It is very complex. Okay, there are hundreds to thousands of different chemical processes occurring within our body to make up our metabolism. I'm going to be explaining what metabolism really is, what hormones contribute to metabolism, and what other factors may uh, interact with these hormones um, to regulate metabolism. And I'm going to be trying my best to simplify um, the mechanisms which I am explaining just so you guys have a full understanding um, of what I am talking about. And at the end of the video, if you are unsure of some of the things that I explained, feel free to send me through an email or a private message on Instagram. So, what is our metabolism? Well, our metabolism is a very complex bodily system that for the most part is regulated by our thyroid gland in conjunction with our nervous system. Okay, so the nervous system actually registers certain stimuli, okay, so present stimuli as an input and sends required signals to the thyroid gland, which then proceeds to regulate your metabolism accordingly. Now, this regulating me mechanism occurs via the upregulation and downregulation of thyroid hormones as T3 and T4, which I will talk about later, which are released from the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland is a major player in regulating your metabolism. Okay, thyroid function has a great correlation with energy expenditure and body weight. Okay, now there are numerous other hormones and factors that come into play when we are talking about metabolism, but today we're going to be focusing on one of the major ones, which is your thyroid gland, which works in conjunction with the nervous system, so your brain and in this case, we're going to be talking about the hypothalamus. And we're also going to cover some other important hormones that play an important role. So, first of all, we need to understand what the thyroid gland is. Now, the thyroid is a gland that sits right underneath the Adam's apple. And it looks something like this. So, a bit of a butterfly shape. Now, just like any other organ in the body, the thyroid gland consists of many cells that cover the whole gland. These are called follicular cells. Okay, so this is the thyroid gland. Now, as I said, the thyroid gland works in conjunction with the nervous system. And in this case, I did say we're going to be talking about the hypothalamus, which sits in the center of the brain, and it actually interacts with other organs in the body. Okay, so it sends signals to the thyroid gland. It also sends signals to fat cells. Okay, so it interacts with fat cells, which are also uh, an endocrine organ. And the hypothalamus looks something like this. And along with the hypothalamus, we also have two pituitary glands, which just hang off it like this. So, pituitary. And we have two, as I said, so we've got a posterior pituitary and an anterior pituitary. And they interact with the hypothalamus, okay? And we can call um, this interaction here the hypothalamic pituitary axis, okay? So H P A, and you might have uh, seen that around you know, in textbooks. Uh, that's what it stands for. Okay, hypothalamic pituitary axis. Hypothalamus registers certain signals, which we will be talking about later. Uh, signals like your nutritional status, uh, your sleep status, certain hormone levels. 
it will actually send out the required signal based on the stimuli that it is registering and it will send the initial signal to the anterior pituitary gland. Now, this signal is called thyrotropin releasing hormone. Okay, so TRH and it's just a hormone that is released from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary and it kickstarts the cascade of signals to allow the hypothalamus to send required information to the thyroid gland. Okay, so that's the first step. Second step is then uh, pituitary gland, so the anterior pituitary will then read those signals, okay, the hormone will bind to certain receptors on the gland, and the anterior pituitary will send out another signal to the thyroid gland, and in this case it's called the thyroid stimulating hormone, so TSH, okay. Now obviously there are going to be a lot of enzymes and receptors that are working in this process to actually make sure signals are being sent to the right places and are being interpreted correctly. But for now, we're gonna skip the, that complexity. As I said, I want, you, I want to try and get message across as best to my abilities to many different uh, viewers who have different levels of knowledge. So we're going to be keeping it pretty simple. If you wanna find out more, feel free to do a YouTube search or read a textbook on endocrinology. Anyway, thyroid stimulating hormone interacts with the follicular cells in the thyroid gland, okay, and the thyroid gland will then proceed to release thyroid hormones, okay, and it's the thyroid hormones which are going to be working to promote the function of the thyroid, okay, which is the end goal of the thyroid gland is to increase your metabolic rate. We'll get into that later. What happens here is the thyroid gland then releases what we call T3 and T4, okay? So two thyroid hormones. Now, it is important to know that within the human body, T3 is very active and T4 is not very active at all. Now, interestingly enough, the thyroid gland actually produces a lot more T4 than it does T3. Okay, so it's about 80-20 ratio. Okay, so what happens is there's a conversion that takes place to ensure that there is enough T3 hormone within the, within the body, within the bloodstream, within the certain target tissues uh, to promote the functions of the thyroid gland. Okay, so what will happen is these hormones will reach the bloodstream. So we can call that the bloodstream there. Okay. They will make their way into the target tissues, which could be skeletal muscle tissue, could be within the liver, okay? Um, call that the tissue there. And within certain tissue, we always have cells, and then we will have a nucleus within that cell. So let's say that's a cell. This is the nucleus there, okay? Upon the thyroid hormones actually entering the certain tissue that they are targeting, that conversion will take place. So T4, most of the T4, will be converted into T3, okay? Now, another thing we need to note down is that this conversion actually triggers a negative inhibition feedback um, from the thyroid gland. So what that means is, upon T3 levels um, being upregulated within the body, your thyroid gland will actually send out signals, so negative inhibition signals, to the hypothalamus and to the pituitary gland, sorry, and it will tell them to slow down or inhibit the release of thyrotropin releasing hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone. Okay, this is to ensure that our body remains at a homeostatic level. Okay, we don't want uh, increasing, increasingly large amounts T3 within the body, okay, or else our metabolic rate will skyrocket. Now, once T3 enters its cell, it will go through all the way into the nucleus, okay. Within the nucleus, we have two receptors waiting for the T3 hormone. Now, the binding of the T3 hormone, so these would be the receptors here, sorry, and the T3 be that there. 
So remember this is within the nucleus. The T3 is binding to its receptors. And this binding will actually increase gene transcription. And again, if you're not familiar with gene transcription, feel free to do some more research. But in very simple terms, it is taking the information from DNA, which sits inside the nucleus, and it's using that inf information to create a smaller, simplified version of the DNA, which we call an mRNA strand. Okay, so if you were to picture that, you'd have the DNA strand, which generally looks something like this. Okay, so that's DNA. So gene, gene transcription is the process of transcribing this DNA and creating what we call an mRNA. Okay, so a simple mRNA strand. And this strand here contains all the information that your body needs to create proteins. Okay, so we use this strand to create specific proteins. And that, that process is called translation. Okay, so we're transcribing the DNA into an mRNA, then we're translating that mRNA into a protein which is going to promote the functions of the thyroid gland, the thyroid hormones. Okay, so this here, this conversion, occurs within the nucleus. Okay, now the translation to a protein from the mRNA occurs outside the nucleus uh, at, at the ribosomes. Um, that's probably something else you might want to research, but the ribosome is kind of like a protein factory, it creates proteins. Okay, so the mRNA will find its way out of the nucleus, back into the cell, to the ribosome where a protein will be created. Okay, so I hope you guys are with me here, but the end result from all of this is going to be a protein that is going to promote the functions of T3, T4. Okay, which, as I said, is generally to increase metabolic rate. Okay, so individuals with hyperthyroidism, so who produce um, increasingly large amounts of thyroid hormone when compared to an individual who doesn't have hyperthyroidism, they will actually have an increased metabolic rate through various mechanisms, which we will discuss, but really they're just going to be burning a whole lot more energy than a standard person who doesn't have hyperthyroidism would be burning, okay? So these people are typically the ones who struggle to gain weight. Now, an individual with hypothyroidism has a suppressed thyroid hormone release. This means that they're going to struggle to lose weight and they're going to be very prone to weight gain. That's because they have a decreased metabolic rate. Um, hypothyroidism can also lead to an increase in fatigue, um, appetite goes up, things like that which will lead to you know, possibly eating excess calories, leading to weight gain, okay? So now that we understand the mechanisms of the thyroid and the, and the hypothalamus, we're gonna talk about some other hormones that may play an important role in this uh, system, very complex system. So the first one we're gonna talk about is one that you've probably heard of and it's called leptin, okay? So I'm just going to list them here. Leptin is produced in the fat cells, and the amount of leptin you have is proportionate to the amount of body fat you have. So when you reduce your body fat levels through dieting, leptin levels will also severely be reduced, and this reduction in leptin will actually send signals to the hypothalamus regarding your appetite, which will probably be increased, regarding your food intake, which will be decreased because you're dieting, and also regarding your body weight, which will also be decreased. Okay, and these signals will cause TRH, so thyroid, uh, thyrotropin releasing hormone, to be slowed down or inhibited. And the reason this occurs is because when you are dieting and you are losing body fat, your body is very concerned about conserving energy. So it's going to do its absolute best to reduce your metabolic rate. And one of the ways is it does so is by inhibiting TRH, which is then going to inhibit other signals like TSH and preceding thyroid hormone release. 
Okay, so leptin affects this pathway here. Another important hormone that does impact metabolism regulation is cortisol, which is generally termed the stress hormone. Okay, and cortisol um, usually gets a bad rap, but we need cortisol to, opt to function optimally, just like we need pretty much every other hormone. Okay, so cortisol actually runs on its own circadian rhythm, where it gets upregulated in the morning and downregulated at night. Now this regulation of cortisol is actually important, and one of the reasons why it is, is because it allows us to optimize our lipolysis, especially when in an energy deficit. Lipolysis being the uh, breakdown of fatty acids in a triglyceride molecule. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why cortisol is important. Now, when cortisol is chronically upregulated due to stress, due to nutrient deprivation, extreme amounts of training, things like that, there can be negative effects like muscle catabolism and also a downregulation of TSH sensitivity. Okay, and what I mean by that is if cortisol is super high, um, specifically for a chronic period, TSH sensitivity to TRH will be reduced. When TRH is released from the hypothalamus, TSH um, secretion from the pituitary glands is going to be scarce. Okay, because the sensitivity is going to be low. Okay, and that is going to impact the amount of thyroid hormone release. Okay, so high cortisol levels are probably going to lead to a decrease in metabolic rate. Okay, but if you look after your stress levels and you are going about your training and nutrition in a strategic manner, then you should have no problem with chronically elevated cortisol levels and you shouldn't really be worrying about cortisol levels too much. Okay, so we've got cortisol there. Yeah, okay, so impact TSH sensitivity. Other hormones which are important are sex steroids, sex hormones. So a reduction in testosterone can also lead to TSH sensitivity being reduced. Okay. So again, inhibiting T3 and T4 release. Okay, so now we're gonna take a step back and we're gonna look at the creation of the protein again. So remember, the function of the protein was to increase metabolic rate. So we're gonna talk about some of the mechanisms in which this occurs. Now, one of the most important ones being BMR. Okay, so your basal metabolic rate. The amount of calories or energy that your body expends on a daily basis to keep you functioning optimally, okay, or to sustain survival. Now what these proteins will do is they will increase cellular metabolic activity and ATP production through several different pathways, and all these processes cost energy, okay, which means you're gonna be expending more energy, okay, your BMR will be increased, that's gonna result in an increase in overall metabolic rate, okay. The second one is protein synthesis. So you guys might have heard of that before. So it costs quite a bit of energy to synthesize new protein, as possibly skeletal muscle proteins. And it also costs energy to retain those proteins. Okay, so having an increase in protein synthesis and a possible increase in skeletal muscle mass it's going to mean that you're going to have an increased metabolic rate. So another factor that comes into play here is an increase in energy consuming processes. So more metabolic activity like glucose absorption, um, even glycogenolysis, which is a conversion of glycogen back into glucose, or gluconeogenesis, which is non-carbohydrate sources being converted to glucose. All these processes are energy expensive, okay, and they're going to burn off more energy, which means you'll have an increased metabolic rate once again. We also have oxygen consumption of tissues. So certain tissues like skeletal muscle tissue, 
So certain tissues need oxygen to be present to fully oxidize certain nutrients, which is going to cost energy and again contributing to your metabolic rate. Okay, now, as I said before, uh, people with hypothyroidism can present with increased fatigue, which will generally lead to a reduction in activity levels. So having a normal uh, amount of thyroid hormone production is probably going to help you keep your activity level stable or even give you enough energy to increase uh, your activity. Okay, so I'll be able to list activity there. Because that definitely plays a role. Okay, so to finish off, a few other factors that aren't hormonal related, which can impact how your metabolism is regulated. Uh, one of them is sleep deprivation. Okay, so sleep can definitely have an impact in thyroid hormone regulation, okay? Another one is stress, okay? So that's a big one. Stress can impact a lot of things, okay? So a lack of sleep will generally impact stress levels, which will increase cortisol, okay? And that, remember, that's going to affect the interaction between certain organs that help regulate your metabolism. And even nutritional status, okay? We can't forget about that one. Being deprived of calories is going to send certain signals to certain organs which are going to tell your body to consume as much energy as possible. That may come from an increase in appetite, okay, or down regulation in activity levels. One way or another, your body is going to resist the fact that you're depriving it of calories, okay? So nutritional status is also something you take into account. So guys, I hope you have a full understanding of what I spoke about today. I hope you guys have a better understanding of metabolism and how it is regulated within the body. I also hope you have an understanding of how some of these hormones work and interact with each other. Okay, and thyroid gland in particular, the way it interacts with the hypothalamus is really interesting and I hope you guys understand the mechanism in which that occurs and how the protein promotes certain functions of the thyroid by increasing metabolic rate via several mechanisms, okay? So remember, today I briefly touched on all of these things. Again, they're super complex um, you know, hormones and, and mechanisms occurring here. So if you wanna know more, send me an email or do some of your own research, okay, but I'm always happy to help. So again, thanks for watching and stay tuned as I'll be uploading another video next week.